Will you turn with me this morning to Revelation chapter 13? <coughs> Revelation chapter 13. As you're turning there, I must say it is interesting how um, events may be moving towards um, the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Um, it was quite interesting this last week looking at the news. It said that, Iran, uh, that uh, Turkey has said it is going to wade into the Middle Eastern issues. And, um, and uh, Iran yesterday turned around and uh, the Ayatollah and he said that um, he calls the, nation, the, the, the Arab nations to revenge against Israel uh, starting today. So, um, when, you know, when you look at the, uh, the Bible, the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 that there will be a big war in the Middle East, that um, Turkey will be the leader, um, which is an Islamic country. Turkey, Iran, Russia will come in as support. Um, uh, Libya, um, Egypt, Lebanon, and Syria. And um, so, you know, we may well be heading into a little bit of a conflict there. And the Bible says that it'll be a one-day war. It speaks of Damascus, which is a, this, obviously the capital of Syria. It's never been destroyed, but it speaks of it in Isaiah chapter 8 as a city that goes, that is destroyed in a ball of light. And, um, and Israel will, will bury the bodies for six months and, just, and uh, burn the weapons of war for seven years. And that fits with the prophecy of uh, Daniel, seventh week, which is the seven-year peace agreement. So who knows where we stand? I, I don't know. But certainly the world is changing, and it uh, might be changing quite radically in our lifetime. Revelation chapter 13, <clears throat> verse 1. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on his horns, and each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear, and the mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast, or Antichrist, seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. They also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. He was given authority over every tribe, people, language and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the book belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Let's come to pray. Gracious and eternal God, we thank you for being able to come together this morning to study ancient and biblical prophecy. Lord, may you open up the prophecies to us. May you give us understanding of this prophecy, Lord, so that we can understand it for where we are in our own world today. Lord, as we look at the world, the world is radically changing. Things seem to be uh, moving towards um, the fulfillment of these prophecies. And uh, Lord, we, we, we really don't know. But Lord, as we look at the world, um, events are happening that haven't happened before. And Lord, we ask and pray in your grace that you instruct us, that you teach us, and that you help us to be spiritually prepared. For Lord, we may well be the generation of the end. And uh, Lord, we, we, can, we can't say we are not because we do not know. But Lord, may you guide us and lead us. Send your Holy Spirit up and down the aisle. Send your Holy Spirit into the pews. Touch each and every one of our hearts. Open our eyes. Give us understanding. Glorify your name. Empower your word into our lives for the glory of Jesus Christ. And God's people say in Jesus, Amen. 
This morning we turn back to our study into the book of Revelation again, Revelation chapter 13. The beast out of the sea, or the coming of an antichrist, which occupies the first half of this particular chapter. And this is the second in our series as we turn and we look at this text together. Now our world is certainly looking for a leader. In fact, it is high hopes that perhaps the next president, the next vice president, the next prime minister, the next monarch, somewhere in our world is going to rise up to solve the problems uh, uh, of the world. As massive as those particular problems are, that this person is going to literally unite the world under him. That he will give hope in the midst of hopelessness. That he will give the nations a sense of security in the midst of a time of great fear. The world is looking for just such a man. As the former Prime Minister of Belgium, Paul Henry Speck, said at the United Nations not so long back, he said, We do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of significant stature to hold the allegiance of all people, to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, be he God or the devil, and we will receive him. And the fact is, such a man is going to be coming. Satan will design him. Satan is literally going to possess him. He is going to be absolutely everything the world thinks that they're looking for in a leader. He is going to rise up literally to world authority. Like no one has ever risen to world power and dictatorship and authority in human history. He is going to be all that people have hoped for, that all that people have imagined a leader could actually be. He will even bring about world peace for a short period of time. There will be world prosperity. People will put their hope and their faith and their desires in him for a while. But he's going to be a man, says the prophecies, who is going to be absolutely satanic to the core. He will be Satan's man. But he will not be the only man that Satan will be pushing out upon the world during those days. For Jesus says in Mark 13 verse 6, He said, Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and what will deceive many? How many? Many are going to come, literally as though they are angels of light to the people of our world. Mark 13, 21, At that time if anyone says to you, Look, here he is, or there he is, Um, Do not believe it. For what? False Christs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive even the elect God's people if that were possible. So be on your guard for I have told you ahead of time. There are going to be many miracles and strange events and incredible speakers and incredible prophets out in the world as the world moves into the time of this man. In 1 John chapter 2 verse 18 the Apostle John wrote, Dear children, This is what? The last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now what? Many Antichrists have come. This is how we know this is the last hour. And so we see according to Scripture, as the world gets closer to its end, that there will be a proliferation, literally, of false leaders in the world. False preachers, false ministers, false churches, literally everywhere across the globe. But one of them is going to be the culmination of all false teachers that have ever been in the history of humankind. He will be the embodiment, literally, of absolute evil, literally all rolled into one. He will be the embodiment of that. And God's word tells you and I that he is literally going to rise onto the world scene when war and hardship and, uh, is increasing in the Middle East. The Middle East is the key. And he will bring about the signing of a peace agreement that will be agreed on between Israel and its Arab nations for a period of seven years. It's the first time in world history that there will ever be a limit put on to a peace agreement. A couple of years ago, the French Prime Minister Marcion tried to bring about an agreement in the Middle East for six years. First time ever. The Bible says it will be signed at seven. And in the last three and a half years of that seven year period, he will suddenly turn and he will pour out his anger against the Jews and God's people after an assassination attempt. 
creating indescribable, literally devastation right across the planet Earth. Millions will die. You've only got to read Revelation chapter 7 to see there. The Bible says in prophecy that it'll be a number that you cannot count. It'll say that he, it'll be people from every tribe, every language, every nation, every people grouping across the world are going to be put to the sword by this evil man. All as Satan literally goes out and empowers this man who arises out of the people and the nations of the world. And Satan's reasoning behind it is that if he can destroy the church, if he can discredit and destroy the state of Israel completely, then he will prevent Jesus Christ from returning to this earth and reigning as king over it. There's no reason for Jesus to come back. Now we hope as God's people that our Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. The return of Jesus Christ is something which is the greatest desire of all of God's people. That one day we will be in the presence of our God. That we will be with Him. That we'll see our loved ones and we'll be able to worship the Lord in the beauty of God's heaven. But before Jesus Christ comes, this Antichrist is going to come. And with it, the most frightening reign of terror ever known is going to crease across this earth. Jesus said in Matthew 24 verse 19, How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in the winter on the Sabbath. For then there will be what? Great distress, unequal from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, what? No one would survive. No one. But for the sake of the elect, God's people, those days will be shortened, says the Lord. Now just to remind you, think about this. From last time, <clears throat> this teaching about uh, the coming of a world leader is not something that is new to you, to you and I as Christian believers. Nor is this something that we are, that we are just uh, uh, um, thinking up perhaps in our own study or thinking up in our study of the book of Revelation itself. Instead, the teaching of these events are well known. And they were well known to God's people throughout the scriptures, going right back to the book of Genesis, going right back into the Old Testament, all the way through into the New Testament itself. And perhaps one of the most powerful books you and I will find on the teaching of a rise of a one world leader and the events of end of history is found in the Old Testament book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 8, 9 and 11. Further, the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, is one who confirmed Daniel's description of this Antichrist. He spoke about this, the, the son of perdition, the, the abomination of desolation, and he confirmed what Daniel said in Matthew 24. The Apostle Paul is one who wrote the earliest epistle, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 we call it. And in that he spoke about the rise of a man who would call himself God and take God's temple and, and rule the planet. In 1 John chapter 2, the Apostle John spoke of the Antichrist spirit that's literally moving across the earth. Even in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 13 is not the first mention of the Antichrist. You and I only have to turn to Revelation chapter 6 verse 1 to read about him. Or look at Revelation chapter 11. In fact, every single chapter of this specific book talks to you and I about the Antichrist. And so the Antichrist spirit... <coughs> Excuse me. And, he, and his efforts to destroy the people of God have always been known to the people of God. It's not something that should shake us as the Christian church. But here in Revelation chapter 13, we come to the final expression of who this man actually is. Satan's superman. This amazing intellectual genius that's going to suddenly appear on the world scene. This outstanding orator, a man of tremendous boastfulness, what he's done, what he's achieved, and what he can do. This master politician, a man of intrigue, says Daniel. A man who will play one side against the other side to get where he wants. An absolute commercial wizard, a military mastermind. 
A man who will claim to be God literally to the world in the last three years of his power. And he will be the world's last and final evil dictator. Now last week we turned and we looked at this man's ancestry. Just to remind you very, very briefly. Look at Revelation 13 <coughs> verse 1. John writes, And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads, and ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. <coughs> In other words, what we see here, uh, here is a picture of Satan standing over the world. He's the dragon, represented by the shore in verse 1. And he summons out of the sea, which represents firstly the nations and the peoples of this world, this beast. The Greek word for beast there is a ferocious killing animal. He summons it out. He calls it out of the nations of the world, out of the peoples of the world. The world's antichrist, the world's leader. And secondly in the Bible, the term sea is also used interchangeably with the word we call the abyss. Abyss which the Bible tells us is one of the most evil, demonic prisons in the entire universe that God created for fallen angels. The place where human spirits go that's called hell is Gehenna in the Greek. The place where angel spirits go is called Tartarus in the Greek. Two different hells. So frightening that in Luke 18 the demons Jesus cast out of the man of the Gerasenes begged Jesus not to send them to this place because it was so bad. Now this is a reference further to this man's character. In that by character, he is a man, despite his smile and his great oratory and his boastfulness, who is so evil, he is so wicked, that it is as though he has been released from one of the most evil demonic prisons in the universe created by God, the abyss. He is absolutely evil. It's almost as though he is literally possessed by an evil angel himself. Revelation 13, 1, it says further of him, He had ten horns, seven heads, and ten crowns on his horns. In Revelation 12, 3, it says of the devil, Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon, Satan, with what? Seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns on his heads. Now I call that a family resemblance, don't you? He is as evil as his father, the devil. We further noted that the Bible always refers to him as an individual, a man. He is spoken of as he, him, his. Some try and say that the Antichrist is just a system or some computer somewhere in the world. It's not. It's he, it's him, it's his. We don't read Christian theories into the book of Revelation. We study the word of God and let God's word speak for itself. But he is a man who rules over a conglomerate, <coughs> a world kingdom that is described as ten horns and seven heads. Now horns in the Bible always represent strength. They represent might. Think of an animal's horns. Think of a big buck. It uses those horns to show its prowess, to show its strength. Think of our study into Daniel, how this man arises from among ten world leaders, ten men of great power, ten men of great strength. They walk into the room in their power suit, as it were, and everybody knows that they're a leader in the world. Daniel 7.24, Daniel describes it this way. The ten horns are ten kings, rulers, who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones, he will subdue three kings. And so the Antichrist arises from amongst ten world leaders. Whoever those world leaders are, maybe it's ten, the world's divided into ten uh, sections, as it were. <coughs> or maybe they are ten leaders, like America, Britain, Germany, who knows. But he arises from them, and then on the world scene he takes three of them out. And he takes their place and their voice in the world today, says Daniel. He has further seven heads because he is the final of seven world kingdoms that God has ordained in history to rule and govern over this world. 
In that, remember, there were seven kingdoms that have governed our world. Think of the greatness of ancient Egypt and how it ruled the ancient world. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Antichrist. He is the final world empire to govern this world, says God. Seven is the number of God. It is God's final number. He is the final dictator. There will be no more earthly rule after him. Something which suits the desires of our world. In that our world not only desires a world leader who will have the answers to the world's problems, but the influence that actually goes with that in society. And so many, many people today are talking about a united world. They talk about what we call globalism today. Globalism. They talk about a global village, a global network, a new world order, a united world, a, a united European parliament, a world court, a united Europe, a cashless and one world currency. We've all heard those catchphrases in our world. Now, yes, at times, certain nations will stand up, perhaps, and they may try and seed away. They may protest. They may want their own sort of freedom in their own country. But according to God's plan, the world will unite, and it will unite under one man. In a united, one world, final kingdom. Even Satan is one who would like to bring about a one world government in which he has absolute control over. And certain governments are trying to bring this about. From the highest levels of government and society right down to the classrooms that teach our children. The United States National Education Association has recorded this. It says... It is with sobering awareness that we set about to change the course of American education for the 21st century by embracing the ideals of the global community and the equality and interdependence of all peoples and nations as we use education as a tool to bring about world peace, end of quote. We are using education to bring about world peace. And so they indoctrinate the children and people. Now think about this. What is frightening in the form of a united one world in its sin is that there are obvious moral consequences to defining a one world. Every culture is different. Nations are different from one another. So there are moral consequences to unite a world as one. And one of those moral consequences, as Alan Bloom warns in his book, The Closing of the American Mind, is exactly that, to close the mind, to close the mind, to change perceptions, to change the way of thinking that happens in the world today, to change ancient values and to remove those values, to break with the old religious morals and create new morals and new values across countries. To create a new way of seeing the world, a new way of thinking in society. One where what was seen as unacceptable and wrong in the past is now acceptable and right in society. Alan Bloom states, quote, <clears throat> In other words, what is essential in globalism is in order to establish a world community is to train its members to be persons devoid of prejudice. End of quote. And so Bloom uses the word prejudice there almost as tongue-in-cheek. Because in the new world community, think about it, there can be no moral absolutes. There can be no one turning around saying, this is 100% right. You've got to do it this way because this is the way it is done and it's always been done. And so to turn around and suggest one point of view is right and another point of view is wrong in the world today, the world defines that as prejudice. It's prejudice. Particularly in regards to Christianity and the law of God. It's seen as prejudice. One stands up and one turns around and one says that um, you, thou, you shall not commit adultery. Who are you to tell me that? You shall not murder. Murderers have rights. We all got rights in life. 
You shall not covet. You shall not steal. There, there's a, you shall obey your parents. It's prejudice. And so the world today rejects Christianity around us. Because nothing is really right. Absolutely. And so you are not to have any opinion that is negative towards anybody else within the global community. What you believe is right for you and what I believe is right for me. We all do as we see. And so this way to unite the world is to create globalism. It is to eliminate absolutes of right and wrong. As Linda Falconstone of the Northwest Region Laboratory states, quote, black and white answers, black and white answers, probably never really existed. But the time is long past when even the myth can endure. Competent world citizens must act and live in the area of greys. In a world where absolutes are absent, end of quote. There's no absolutes. We live in a world of grey. And so in terms of Christianity and firmness to God's law, standing by the word of God, that is seen today as prejudice in our world today. To say that Jesus is the only way to God, that is prejudice. That's your view. It's not my view. Instead, the catchword of our world today is tolerance. It's acceptance. You've got to build a one world system. There is no clear line in, in, in the world of grace. There is no absolute law anymore. It's a world of human rights, where every human has rights, including the criminal. Christianity cannot be suggested as absolutely right, nor can God's law be upheld. That would be against the rules, <coughs> says our world today. After all, nothing is, is, is right absolutely, and nothing is wrong. You get a good lawyer, you can get off anything you want today. In America, it is called values clarification. And so if you are going to unite all countries, and you're going to unite all nations and peoples and the world, under the dragon, under Satan, who stands over the world, and he summons his beast, his leader, to govern the world out of the nations of people then you need to start right now by eliminating dogmatism at work, in government, at school. Get rid of this absolute laws of, telling, of, of children obeying parents. Get rid of the absolute laws. Change the way people think. You need to eliminate truth. So that like Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, a man without God, he stood before Jesus, the Son of God, and he said in Luke, John chapter eight, uh, 18, verse 38, What is truth? said Pilate. What is truth? That's our world today. And so there are no absolutes anymore, for that would be prejudice. And I'm sure you've all noticed this. In that what was frowned on 20 years ago in our society, in our parents' generation, is now accepted as a normal part of daily life. What our grandparents went and accepted in their lifestyle is now rejected. In fact, it's looked on as archaic and people will laugh at the values that they held to in their lives and families. Even in Christianity, what was preached and believed with great power in our parents' generation from the pulpit is no longer preached in many churches today. Instead, the church lives in the area of greys. Not def definitive, it's grey areas. Don't offend anyone, says the church today. Where everyone is accepted in terms of lifestyle, whether that person's heart and life has changed for Jesus Christ or not. Just accept everyone. Whether their people are seeking to obey Christ or not, just accept. You see, the catchword in the church now isn't any more repentance and obedience to God. It's love, and God understands you. You just be the person you are when there should be obedience to the commandments of a saving God. And so you can't teach Christian truth and prayer in schools anymore. That's not acceptable. God is out of government. God is out of families. God is out of relationships. God is out of marriage. God is out of everything. Out of everything. 
We are now becoming a global village. Absolutes are being removed from society. We are a people now connected by the electronic networks of the world. Pick up any single cell phone. You can Google and look at anything. We're all connected. We are moving into a global community in preparation for a one world leader. All as Satan stands over the nations and the peoples of the world and he summons his leader, his antichrist, his beast out of the sea so that we become a global village. I wonder, are you somebody today who is spiritually ready for this? Are you somebody today who is ready to face the coming of a one world leader? The coming of an antichrist? How does this all make you feel? Because that's where we're going. That's why things are happening as they're happening. That's the thinking and the reasoning behind a global village. Well, enough of that. Let's go to point number two. What is the authority of the Antichrist? <coughs> Revelation 13 verse 2. John writes, The beast, Antichrist, I saw resemble the leopard, but he had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon, Satan, gave the beast, Antichrist, his power and his throne and great authority. Wow. What a picture. Can you imagine somebody looking like this? You say, awesome. It's not awesome. This is how God describes the coming of a one world leader. He has ten horns, ten crowns, and seven heads. He has feet that look like a leopard. Uh, uh, <coughs> he, has, uh, he has feet rather like a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. I must say to you, it always amazes me how people try and draw pictures of this. Most have gruesome pictures. But what is the point of these animals that are being used in the Bible? What is the point of these verses and the description in it in verse 2? Well, let me show you. In Daniel chapter 7 verse 2, if you go and look at it, we see the prophet Daniel had a vision there where God went and showed him four beasts that are going to come out of the earth. Four empires. And they were Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. And God then went and pictured these four world empires as animals. They were common to the Jewish people. They were animals that would have been known to the people of God to whom this book was given. They all knew what a leopard was like in Israel. They all knew what a bear was like. They had bears in the hills. They all knew what it looked like. Daniel 7, look at verse 2. Daniel said, In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me were four winds of heaven, churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came out of the sea. The first was like a lion. Stop there. Look at verse 5. And there before me was a second beast which looked like a bear. Verse 6. After that I looked and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. Now that sounds like the book of Revelation, doesn't it? You say, why does God make these countries look like animals? Well, he does so simply because the character of these animals represents the character of these nations. That's how they are governed. That is the direction that they take in daily life, in history. The Babylonian nation was a lion. In other words, it was always roaring. Always roaring. It was always making threats politically. Making threats against other nations. There was a roaring going on. It prowled around for prey. Babylon literally captured the entire ancient world. It was powerful. It had an extremely powerful army. The Medo-Persian Empire was like a bear. An animal that had terrible paws. One able to tear and to literally crush its prey. It was violent. It was aggressive. It was dangerous. It was unpredictable. One day the king would say this, the next day his army was doing something else. Greece was a leopard, an animal that hides. It's swift, it's strong, it's agile, it's cunning. I don't know if you've ever been in the bush with a leopard, but it's cunning. It sneaks around, it climbs a tree. You've got to look in the trees to see where it is at times. It can drag its prey up that tree. A bear, a lion, and a leopard. Now, by God giving these countries these descriptions, the people in ancient Israel would have been able to read of the animal, look at the country, and they would have been able to understand how that country would have actually behaved. That's what God was telling them. He was teaching them as his children. They knew. Now, look back at Revelation 13, verse 2. 
And what we see here now is a description of the character of this Antichrist and our world in the last days of world history. Are you ready for this? For it's a picture of our world militarily, politically, financially, economically, a global village under the coming Antichrist. And that God says it's going to be a lion, it's going to be a bear, and it's going to be a leopard. And on this, please notice, this isn't three world empires all rolled, uh, 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 speaking of one another. This is three world empires rolled into one man. Not separate empires. One man is going to wield this power. This is what the beast, the Antichrist, is going to be like in his own rule. A world governed by Satan's man from his headquarters at the United Nations will be a bear, a lion, and a leopard. Meaning that this world and its world leader is going to be the most dangerous, threatening, militarily aggressive, violent, unpredictable, fierce, swift, deceiving, crushing world empire that's ever existed in the history of mankind. This is what the world is going to become. And you and I are heading down that road very fast today. The Antichrist is going to be the head of it all. He may well be on the world scene now, if we're in that time period. As I've said before, you look at a photograph of world leaders standing on the steps of a big building, the UN building, and in the corner is the man, the little horn. You know, as you and I think about the United States, how the United States sends its military all the way around the world, huge carrier battle groups moving across from one place in the world to another place in the world. If we sit back and we think about, <coughs> um, we sit back and we think about how our names and our details are registered on the computer. You go to a country in the world and you pull out your ID, they type it into the computer and they can bring up your home address, they can bring up all your details. If you and I sit back and we think about the police forces of Nazi Germany or so the former Soviet Union or North Korea and how dangerous they are. If you and I sit and we think about how the churches were closed under COVID. If you and I sit back and we think about a centralized control over the economy and government. Such will be the coming of the Antichrist. No one will escape his law. Any form of rebellion will be crushed. I wonder... <clears throat> How are you living spiritually in a world that already has the footprint of the Antichrist upon it? Spiritually, are you somebody this morning who is passionate about God and the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you passionate about the Bible? Are you cleaving to God daily in your own life? For Revelation 13 too, it says, The dragon, Satan, gave the beast his power, his throne, and great authority. Who's the power behind the Antichrist's throne? Satan. And as you see there in verse 2, this coming world leader doesn't just have power. It says he's got great power. Great power. It's as though 2 Thessalonians 2, 6, Jesus removes the hand of restraint, he says in that part of the scriptures, at that time, and for the first time a world leader has no accountability. He can do anything he wants, whenever he wants, and how he wants it, and say what he wants, and he's going to get away with it until the end. And what a world it's going to be. In that, remember, all the demons of Ephesians chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 12 are now down on this earth for the first time in world history. Every fallen spirit from heaven is now suddenly on this planet. Even those out of the abyss have been released as locusts, and, uh, and a demonic army. In fact, in terms of that demonic army, the Bible says 200 million demons, fallen angels, will ride across this world attacking mankind. Arming people. Those who do not have upon them the mark of God. Those that don't, the, the demonic can see it, they will be attacked. And at that same time, God is pouring out His wrath and His fury on a collapsing universe. The Holocaust will be absolutely unimaginable. Question. What are the circumstances that allow this man to come to power? And with this we close. Well, before we close, let me just remind you. And that is invariably, <clears throat> a dictator rises to power in chaos, doesn't he? 
in that the environment, the cost of living, the crime are suddenly out of hand worldwide. When there are no answers, there seems to be no solutions politically. Everybody's just talking and talking and the country gets worse and worse and worse and worse and there is chaos. War seems to be increasing. Poverty is increasing. The homelessness seems to be increasing. It is then that you have a perfect situation for such leadership to develop. Think of Hitler. And that is true in any kind of leadership. Leaders are born in a crisis. Leaders rise in the midst of an unsolvable form of problems in the world. Leaders come to the top when there are no solutions in the world. And this man, supported by Satan the devil, steps forward, signs a peace agreement in the Middle East, brings the parties together, works it out for seven years, and literally stuns a world that is anxious about what is happening in that part of the world. He comes forward with the answers. He seems to have the solutions to the economic hardships of our world. And with Satan's power, promises peace to the world, and the nations of men turn, and they follow him, giving him a standing ovation as a man of the Nobel Peace Prize. As we close, can I ask you a question? And that is, not do you know of God? A lot of people know the scriptures and know of God. But does God know you as His? Does God know you as His? Many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, I did this for you. He says, I don't know you. Does God know you as His? Do you have absolute surety in your heart today that you are going to heaven one day? That your eternity is absolutely secure before God tonight? Do you in your own heart have the hope of going to heaven? And you know it this morning without any form of doubts. Is Jesus Christ for you the Son of the living God? The one who came into this world to die, to redeem you, to take away your sins. Have you called upon the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness and for salvation? And if not, won't you tell him now? Call upon him now. Ask him to be your savior and to forgive you now. And if you are somebody here today who knows the Lord, <clears throat> are you walking with Jesus Christ? Loving Him in a changing environment, in a changing world. Showing Him by your love that you love God. That you love your neighbor. As John says, dear children, love one another. Do you pray and do you talk to God in an intimate daily form of relationship? Do you read God's word every single day for the world in which we live? is constantly and continually changing all the time. The Belgian Prime Minister said, we do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people, to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking as a world. Send us such a man, be he God or the devil, and we will follow him. That's in the UN. Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him by giving it life. Are you embracing? Which road are our family and friends embracing? Let's bow and pray before the King. Perhaps the Lord God has touched your heart this morning. Maybe in terms of your relationship, your prayer time, your Bible reading. Maybe you've never called upon Jesus to be your Savior, to forgive you your sins. Maybe your family hasn't. Won't you just speak to the Lord for a moment? Won't you ask the Lord to guide you in a changing world, in a changing environment? 
a world that may well be moving in our lifetime to the coming of an Antichrist. Won't you ask God to help you to be firm in the Bible, firmer than you've ever been? Because we and our families need God's word. Perhaps if you don't know the Lord, you can repeat this prayer quietly in your heart after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I do believe the Bible says God loves me. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to forgive me for all my sins, to be my Savior, to help me to live a new life in which you are pleased. I commit my life to you in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we commit all things to you this morning. We ask and pray, Lord, that in your grace and your sovereignty that you touch our hearts, that you help us to look at world events such as Turkey getting involved, such as Iran saying, calling for revenge of all nations. Lord, we know that these things can lead to a greater war. And Lord, the, the world itself is looking for a leader. There's only weak political leaders seemingly across the globe at the moment. But one man may well come forward in our lifetime. Lord, may you help us to be firm in the Bible and firm in the Scriptures. Lord, where our families may be weak, may we be there to guide them and to lead them because they need to know your word. Where we are weak in our faith, help us to grow stronger. And Lord, help us to be wise to the events of the times in which we live. We don't know when these things may happen. They could happen in a hundred years from now. But Lord, the way the world is at the moment, Lord, we step before you very carefully. Glorify your name this morning. Help us to be godly people committed to Jesus Christ. For Jesus' sake we pray. And God's people say, Amen.